Hey, one more thing before you go. In this episode, domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, parental alienation, and intergenerational family trauma, we're going to have a conversation with a woman whose life journey experienced each and every one of those traumas, and then experienced an epiphany when she says God came to her garage sale. She wrote about it and now dedicates her life to helping others through their ordeals. I'm your host, Michael Hurst. This is One More Thing Before You Go. My guest in this episode is Dr. Moni Hill Potterero, whose life was forever changed after experiencing numerous trauma-induced spirituality transformative encounters, also known as STEs. She's an award-winning author, a speaker, an educator. Her unique spiritual fiction, God Came to My Garage Sale, which is a brilliant title, is an inspirational fiction vignette collection of spiritual miracles inspired by true events experienced at an ordinary garage sale by an atheist woman who encounters numerous ethereal people and divine events. I'm looking forward to talking about that journey and experience, challenging her long-held belief systems and forever transforming her life. After surviving family trauma, which led her to being open to the universal signs and synchronicities, she began writing to heal with a five-book series entitled True Deceit, False Love, which addresses domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, parental alienation, and intergenerational family trauma. We're going to have a conversation about her amazing journey. Welcome to the show, Arnie. Oh, hey, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on One More Thing Before You Go. You know, I really appreciate uh, where you've come from in life after understanding some of your background and where you have grown from. And uh, what an amazing journey that you've uh, embarked upon throughout your life. And you've taken it to such a level that you're sharing that positivity, that motivation, that inspiration, and that education with uh, all of us. Yeah, well, it has been a journey, but yes, I have decided to handle these challenges in a positive way. And, you know, like many other people that handle adversity, at some point they get to a level where they want to share with others and and maybe save Mm -hmm. them from some of the heartache that you have gone through, but at least bring awareness. I think that um, that's a very significant factor in understanding where we're at in life is to, number one, first be aware and then uh, start with an understanding and then uh, we get to make a choice. And and I think you've made a really positive choice in working towards a positive arena. So thank you for that. Let's kind of start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? (laughs) I grew up in Lake Forest, Illinois. Um, my parents, um, were very kind of, uh, non-hands-on parents. So we had a lot of freedom as kids to just explore our neighborhood and our town and, um, our interests. And definitely I had a lot of exposure to the natural world. Um, I actually spent the first few years of my life, um, on a college campus. So, I had a really different upbringing than a lot of my classmates, but I grew up in Lake Forest, Illinois, and um, of course thought that I would move out of Lake Forest and live in Paris or something like that, but I ended up graduating high school early and starting college in Illinois and um, became a teacher, and that is where my story began. Where did you, uh, what were your parents like? I mean, you you said that it was kind of a, uh, and, uh, not really saying open relationship, yeah. but you know, I remember growing up as a kid, and you know, we could go out and play till it got dark, and you know, when yeah. the streetlights come on, we went home, and you know, we kind of we're we're not going to give our ages away, but I'll say we're close. <laughs> yes, we are. We are. Um, you know, my dad was a college professor um, at uh, you know the local college, and uh, my mom was a writer, a substitute teacher. Um, 
And, you know, she struggled some, and we're going to talk about some intergenerational family issues, um, but it really took kind of growing up and then looking back at my childhood to realize that, you know, there were a lot of patterns that were, were repeated. But, um, you know, both of my parents were very intelligent and are very intelligent. My mom passed away many years ago. Um, they're definitely grounded in um, the love of humanity and love of the natural world and and love of travel. So, you know, um, I took away as many positive things as I could from both of my parents. And you, since you, both of your parents were educators, you went on to become an educator yourself, were you not? Yeah. Yeah, they both actually, they met um, teaching um, English at the university level in Florida. So that's mm -hmm. where they met. And um, yeah, my mom, um, who was extremely um, intelligent and academically um, almost a genius in my eyes, um, you know, she earned her master's degree at Chapel Hill at North Carolina back in the day when people from her generation, but also from her area did not pursue higher education, but she definitely did and could have gone on um, if that was something that would have been in the, the cards for her. But yeah, you know, of course, growing up, I thought, well, I'll never be a teacher. I want to do something different. But um, I definitely, you know, was called to being an educator and loved my career as a as a teacher. I, I retired a few years ago from a 35 year career as a high school special education teacher in the Chicago suburbs. And 12 of those years, I was a university graduate school adjunct professor. So early, I've always had a love of learning, you know, went on to get my doctorate degree in 1997. Um, in education from Northern Illinois University. And, and then even later on after that, I uh, pursued postdoctoral work at Harvard um, because I just love learning and I wanted to be current with uh, what was, was out there, what the research had to say about, you know, how we teach and what we teach. Now, it's all very different now, so I'm so glad I did it when I did it. Well, thank you for uh, your contribution to the education of our youth and yeah. our adults. I really appreciate you uh, being there and doing that. I think that uh, teachers and instructors and professors don't get enough uh, kudos and pats on the back. So uh, thank you very much. Well, yeah, thank you for thanking me. It was really an honor. It was, it was a calling, like I said, and there, there were some wonderful years in my life. Uh, knowing, and I'm the kind of teacher too, Michael, that I just wasn't up there, you know, imparting knowledge or lecturing. I'm the kind of teacher that really likes to help young adults feel mm -hmm. good about themselves and, and encourage them to be independent in seeking out information so that they could be lifelong learners. So it was more about that than it was about, you know, teaching content. When you first got involved in, in the, your teaching career, I know that you said out of high school, well, we all want to go to Paris after we get out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I don't know. That's what I thought. And, and I wanted to go to Paris because really a Joni Mitchell song, you know, about really? a free man in Paris. And I just, uh, I really, I, and I always loved, you know, travel as a young uh, kid, when I was around 10 years old, our family packed up and moved to Athens, Greece for a year. While my dad had, um, you know, uh, taught a program abroad and took a sabbatical writing, and um, and our family experienced living in Athens, Greece, which was amazing and actually had a significant positive impact on my life for many years to come. Just in in my values of accepting people with different backgrounds and and different languages and you know, different experiences. Yeah, I wish we all could do that, you know, when you first come out, just so you can get a worldwide view of uh, what else yeah. is out there. And like you said, experiencing other cultures and lives and how we all, we're all interconnected, you know? Right, we're actually more alike than we are different. Exactly, we're all interconnected, it kind of works out. Um, mm -hmm. Had you, when you first went into into college, how well, your intention was to be a, an instructor 
Do, did you get your degree in that? No, I mean, I did get my degree, but no, that wasn't my intention. I actually wanted to be a fashion designer. And I thought, you know, my ticket out, because I really wanted to start college early more to get out of my house and to be independent and just kind mm -hmm. of show my parents, um, my dad especially, that I'm going to make it on my own, no matter how messed up you two are. They were, you know, had a very high conflict divorce. And I just, my, my uh, drive was to just move forward and, and, but do it in a productive way. And I thought college was the way to do that. So I actually went with the intention of going into business thinking, I didn't really know what specifically I love mm. fashion. I loved that idea, but you know, um, when you're young, you just kind of pull, you know, careers out of the air, I think, and just kind of go for it. But um, I ended up taking more business classes as opposed to my gen eds in the beginning, which then by the time I really switched to education, and there's a whole story behind that when I switched though, and, and it, um, it turned out to be the best move for me, but I ended up needing to stay an additional year because, um, you know, I hadn't taken those general mm -hmm. courses that you're supposed to take because I was so interested in just getting right down to the business of what I was interested in, which was business. And, and then um, I had some very cool opportunities after I chose education as a career. I had some cool opportunities to take some additional classes and kind of practicum experiences to get additional certification uh, because I didn't know what area of special education I would wind up in. And so I wanted as many certifications under my belt that I could get during that time as possible. And, uh, but it all worked out and, and actually, you know, I was offered my first teaching job in Buffalo Grove, Illinois, where I stayed for, you know, the first five, six years of my teaching with special education, um, but as a resource teacher, but dealing with kids that had some learning challenges or behavior challenges. And again, I was all about, you know, helping them feel good about themselves and, and to realize their strengths that, you know, we all have different ways to learn and it's okay to be who they are. That's amazing. Actually, I think that uh, your contribution in that arena, um, unfortunately, uh, needs to be addressed a little deeper across the country. And uh, you filled that niche you know, from what I can hear very well. So yeah. and um, I'm still in touch with some of my students from way back then, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. they're in their late forties and I'm still in contact with okay. them and, and they still, many of them have still said to me what an impact I made and, and that, um, you know, I taught them some life skills mm -hmm. and I acknowledged their emotions and their feelings and, and they remember that they might not remember what, I taught them, but they remember how they felt when I taught them. That's an amazing teacher, actually. Um, I've had a couple in my lifetime that have had an impact on me like that, that I remembered very distinctly. And um, I still follow some of those patterns even today. Uh, yeah. I, I'll stop and do something and I'll go, eh, that little voice, like here in my ear <laughs> is going, no, don't do that, do this. So, right. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about how you, I know that we, we mentioned already about the intergenerational yeah. family trauma. See, I said it right that time. Yes, <laughs> uh, the intergenerational family trauma. Um, when you first decided to write the books to heal, uh, at what point in, in, in your lifetime did you get to there where you went, I, I really think I need to write. I know that people journal. Um, they start with journaling and they start with writing a, a diary, I guess, um, of which I think journal and diary are close. Uh, wow. What gave you your inspiration to become an author? Well, you know, my first book was um, the spiritual fiction, is the spiritual fiction, God Came to My Garage Sale. And I was inspired to write that because I had been um, 
you know, experiencing some miracles at this particular garage sale. And to kind of go back a little bit, I, at one point, felt I was living the American dream, you know, living in suburbia, uh, raising my two beautiful children in a beautiful home, in a beautiful neighborhood, um, married for many years, knowing that that wasn't perfect. I ignored a lot of red flags that I really should have paid attention to. But um, at one point in my life, you know, the light bulb really went on and enough was enough. And I chose to divorce. And that was, you know, after 27 years of marriage. So you can only imagine that there were many years that I had kind of looked the other way at wrongdoings or unethical behavior or just ignoring the way I was treated and how I felt. And, um, you know, uh, just things that many people would experience and say, oh, I'm getting out of this. But I plugged along, kind of projecting my own honesty and goodness and my integrity onto who I was married you know, with, when really that wasn't who he was all about. Um, but I didn't know, you know, um, uh, I, uh, that's why they say you ignore a lot of red flags. And so even though I thought our home was paid off for many, many years, um, and I, um, you know, thought I could live there forever. And I, I, I thought I could go along. I, I really couldn't, you know, um, I, I, I think that if I would have stayed, it would be for the wrong reasons. And I would be role modeling for my adult children that, you know, it's okay to be treated poorly and you just have to put up with it. And so, you know, I just had no idea though, the repercussions with domestic abusers that a lot of the abuse really kind of amplifies and ramps up after you realize that their mask has slipped and you kind of see their true colors and uh, and you and you escape, you know, they don't want you to escape. So, you know, I did have to have a garage sale and but instead of having feelings of sadness or anger or, you know, uh, revenge you know, that which isn't part of who I am. And all those feelings would have been very justified, you know, to have. I just had feelings of love and goodness. And I was grateful for, you know, the many years that I had there. And they all weren't bad. Uh, even though I look back now and there was a lot of false reality that I was living off of it, it was my false reality. And I, I had, you know, in many ways, a beautiful life, I believed. Um, and definitely I had great memories at this home. That's where, you know, I raised my kids into their twenties. And uh, when I chose to divorce their dad, um, my daughter was 20 and my son was 23. And so, you know, now it's, um, you know, close to a decade later. And, um, but I had wonderful memories at that time, but at this garage sale, I had miracles that came my way, uh, things that really were hard to explain with our ordinary language and, and also with my foundation of being an atheist, um, cause that's how I grew up, even though I, I was so curious and I leaned towards and followed through with organized religion as an adult, I was really having some pretty spiritual miracles happen. And that prompted me not only to pay attention to those and to other signs and synchronicities, but to also research. I'm someone who needs proof. I need evidence, you know, for me to really believe something. And I really sought out, um, you know, others who had had spiritual transformative experiences or awakenings or even near-death experiences that would come back and talk about a lot of the same feelings that I felt. And just like so many people that experienced these things, I was compelled to talk about it and write about it. So that's where my first book, True uh, a God Came to My Garage Sale, came about. And um, it was it was actually endorsed by James Redfield, who wrote The Celestine Prophecy, uh, which was pretty amazing because he doesn't normally endorse people and has his own, you know, 
kind of world with the Celestine vision and his own number of books, but he saw value in what I did. And then, and then that book went on to win a lot of awards. And I, I still do book signings with that book. And I know it's a part, it's part of many book clubs nationwide, actually internationally. So that's, that's very validating that, you know, my spiritual fiction kind of resonated with people. And even though it's a spiritual fiction, it's based on the true experiences that I had. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, it, it, you said you were an atheist. Um, so help our listeners and our viewers understand what an atheist is. On no belief in anything. You're not even questioning, you know, and that's mm -hmm. how I grew up. I grew up, um, my father specifically is a devout atheist, if there is such a thing. Um, and he's even written books on religion and, you know, he mm. was a philosophy professor. So he certainly, um, you know, is a very knowledgeable, you know, academic when it comes to this, but um, really kind of um, didn't expose the children mm self or my brothers to to organized religion or or spirituality and and actually when we questioned these kinds of things as a philosopher you know he would come back with another question for us you know it was all about questioning but uh never about saying that you know possibility exists kind of a thing yeah. Yeah. No, and and believed in the community aspect of church, but you know didn't even include us in anything like that, which which was fine. And on my own, actually at the college level, on my own, I just knew there had to be something more because, mm -hmm. you know, just even when you look at our bodies and the physical systems that our bodies have and how we can heal ourselves and how intricate they are, and then mm -hmm. when you look at nature, it's just you know even today. I, I am fascinated with nature around me and I can spend long periods of time just watching one hermit crab, you know, do its thing or watch a bird building a nest. And I'm just fascinated and I, I'm in awe of that. And to me, it, it, you know, even those natural things, I believe have to have, you know, something divine mm -hmm. in there. And so I, I changed my belief. And of course, you know, got involved in organized religion, baptized Presbyterian when I was in college, um, became Catholic um, through a program when my family was young because I wanted us all to be together. Um, it's kind of funny, my, you know, in some ways I did that because my husband was Catholic. Uh, but as soon as I became Catholic, we never saw him at church unless it was at the holidays, but I actually became a lector. I started reading at church and because I wanted to learn about the Bible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I'm a lifelong learner, but I was very much involved. But really, um, after having these experiences at the garage sale that actually opened up numerous other experiences, um, I, I feel like I've become more spiritual, not so much, um, you know, a supporter of organized religion, especially with all the hypocrisy and, you know. Well, I'm there with you. I grew up Catholic and I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, but I'm a very spiritual individual and I have a very strong belief in the universe and what's up there and where we stand in it and, and so forth. So from that perspective, I, I'm there with you. I think that, you know, my parents, um, uh, briefly, because we have a lot in common in regard to some of those things, you know, my mother was a devout Catholic, and uh, uh, when they got divorced, uh, my mother was uh, excommunicated from the church because of the divorce, and, you know, uh, in turn, us kids were. And I had to stop and think about that. It's like, well, you're supposed to open your arms to us. And, when you need them the most, you yeah. know, when you need that community. And kind of went from there. So that's where my transformation kind of came a little bit from that perspective. Uh, yeah. I kind of moved forward into a more spiritual aspect. Um, the, the it's very interesting that that this took place. Your your awakening. I, I can't do quotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> your awakening uh, happened at a garage sale. Can you give us an yeah. example of, of kind of what what one of those miracles were? 
Yeah, I mean, there were so many. And of course, I outlined them all in my book. Um, but at one point, I was looking back at my home from the cul-de-sac, just, um, you know, being thankful, being grateful and, and in a state of deep reflection, uh, which I will say, all these experiences I have had are when I'm in a kind of a meditative state of reflection and, and being grateful and thankful. And um, all of a sudden, a dragonfly circled me and I thought, that's pretty neat. And right away, there were like five dragonflies and I had never experienced that, but that was pretty neat. But seriously, within about a seven, eight, nine minute period, I was surrounded by 50 and almost what I believe to be a hundred dragonflies circling me. And I could actually see them go down the street and come on back to the cul-de-sac and circle me. And everything was in slow motion. It was almost like I was having an out-of-body experience. And um, I could see the veins of each of the wings and I could see the iridescent colors um, on the bodies and, and they were different sizes. I remember really paying attention to the sizes and immediately my mind equated them with generations of loved ones so that there were babies and toddlers and teenagers and young adults. And I just felt I was just surrounded either by my ancestors. I even had the thought, maybe they are ancestors from the neighborhood. I mean, I didn't have any one in particular in mind. I just felt the love and that, you know, the message I got was that I was surrounded and um, I was supported and that, you know, yes, I was making a big transition, but it was almost validating that the decision I was making was part of my life's journey. And so that was one of those. And actually, Michael, about three quarters of the way through this experience, which to me lasted hours and hours, even though it wasn't that long at all. It's like time stood still. I knew to pull out my cell phone and actually videotape this so that I had record that I actually was surrounded by this many dragonflies. And then I later, with my own research, and then a very neat experience in Minnesota um, that following Thanksgiving, uh, when I was spending a, my first of all my holidays without family, um, I went to Taylor's Fa Taylor Falls, Minnesota for skiing. And, you know, it was Thanksgiving in this very quaint little town that I came across this dancing dragonfly winery. And it turns out the person who is the founder owner of this winery had the same experience that I did, you know, in a, in a state of trauma or transition that could have been negative they were surrounded with positive love and many, many, many dragonflies. And in that particular person's case, it was so profound. They opened up a winery called the Dancing Dragonfly. And, you know, in my case, I that was my first chapter in my spiritual fiction. The correlation with uh, the, yeah. the dragonfly, how do you... I mean, is there a significance to the dragonfly? Is there something in your childhood or something that that do you think that, that it was drawn to you from that perspective? You know, I don't think so. I don't think I can really look back and think that I had a dragonfly experience or there was some significance. I went on to research just like I do. I always right. need to check out things that in so many cultures, the dragonfly means transformation. You know, um, there's one, and I haven't ever mentioned this before in any other interview, but there's one culture, and I don't know all the details, where the dragonfly actually symbolizes um, silence, where, really? you know, remember the movie Silence of the Lambs? Yeah. And the actual visual for that was a dragonfly over the mouth. Of oh, yeah, yeah. Now I think back on the, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I've never really even paid too much attention to this because I'm really all about love and positivity. Right. And I try to, to take away, okay, dragonflies mean transformation. But, you know, um, silence 
you know, silencing your voice is what abusers want to do. They don't want you yep. to speak the truth because then people might realize that their behavior or actions and, you know, intentions are not the upstanding false persona that they kind of show the public. And so, um, later on in my life, I, I really came to the conclusion that, you know, I am part of an intergenerational abuse situation. And I, I believe that I witnessed a lot of things as a child where my father was abusing my mother, yet he would come across as the most upstanding community member ever. But, you know, um, it's really like peeling the layers of an onion and it takes age and wisdom and kind of going through your own experiences to realize that, you know, you might have experienced or seen some things, definitely how it played out with my mother, um, you know, has all the hallmarks of, of being someone who was domestically abused and gaslit to believe that they are not worthy. And um, in her case, uh, she tried to end her life a number of times. And, you know, yeah, you could say possibly there was postpartum, but there were no discussions of that. It was just that she was mentally ill and, and you know, she was suicidal and all the fingers pointed at her, you know, instability. And now that I've done a lot of research on domestic abuse and intimate partner violence, I, I realized that um, how things played out between my mother and father are very textbook um, when it comes to, to domestic abusers and people that are not diagnosed, but have narcissism, you know, those traits and, and they will defend their narrative till their dying day, you know, and, um, and it's been a hard realization, you know, because I had to also look at myself and I had to look at how, how, what, what role did I play in relationships, not only with my ex-husband, but with a best friend or with neighbors or with, you know, other childhood friends, how did I play out the dynamics in the relationships? And I was always an overgiver and a people pleaser. And uh, even though I was very strong willed and, and really felt I was independent and, and, you know, uh, on the right path, I think that I really allowed, um, I kind of looked the other way. I was like the dragonfly on the mouth, very silent for so long because I just wanted to see the good in everyone, including, including my father. And um, my eyes are open now more. And it's a very, very tough thing later on in life to realize that, you know, maybe you were looking at things in a false reality and you're coming into what you believe is your reality, but you know, you, for years, you've, you've gotten very comfortable with questioning yourself. So you wonder, Oh, should I really think that? Or did he really mean that? Or did I see that? But you know, yeah, at some point you see what you see, you hear what you hear, you know, what you know, and you know, you do the best you can. And, and sometimes putting the pieces of the puzzle together, um, you realize, you know, you've got to come to what your belief is and, and act on that or not act on it, you know, depending on how you want to handle it. Yeah. And that journey within itself, I think that is what inspired you to write the, um, your next five book series, right? Yes. Yeah, most definitely. And actually it started out more just with me trying to understand what did I go through? You know, I, I moved from a lifetime in the Chicago suburbs um, to the Caribbean where I'm just enjoying a beautiful life, but it's definitely been part of my healing journey in many ways. And I would write down terms that I would hear from podcasts or researchers, right. 
you know, or books that I would read when I'm trying to understand what is domestic violence? What is parental alienation? You know, I never knew what that was. I didn't even know what narcissism was. So I would write down different terms or phrases to look up later and then try to connect the dots to my own experience. Before I knew it, I had a hundred terms to look up. And then, and then I had a thousand terms. And then when the list got to over 10,000 terms, that prompted me to write my first book, which um, is, is 15,555 terms and phrases on domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, and parental alienation. So that started my writing journey to heal. And then from there, um, I was still trying to make sense of my own emotions and experiences. And I found I always loved writing acrostic poetry where you write the word vertically and connect sentences to that. And I thought, wow, I have a lot of terms I can choose from. So, you know, I, I, in my second book, I picked 13 terms for each, um, letter of the alphabet, kind of the teacher in me, I needed some structure and organization. And so I wrote, you know, I think it comes out to 338 acrostic poems addressing all of these issues and from various points of view this isn't like you know just personal right. poem i i did it from an abuser's point of view from a dad's point of view a mom's point of view a grandparent that's been alienated um you know so i i i wanted to reach a wide range of people that might find they need to look into these words themselves and understand them, but they may not have the energy to, to read a full blown book on all of this stuff. But, you know, uh, and I did receive amazing endorsements actually from so many people that I looked up to that I admired and I got guidance from, they turned around and said, Marnie, what you're doing, this is a very creative approach to handling this kind of trauma. This is something we've never seen before, Mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and then I went on to write a survivor's workbook, um, where people could, if they find writing to be healing for them, they could, they could create their own acrostic poems. And then I did some free verse poetry was extremely healing. Um, you know, very general, but very personal at the same time. And then the last book, actually, it's it's not really the last book. It's the fifth of a six book series, because I'm working on a sixth book, but is a word search puzzle book where, you know, you see the words and, you know, you see related words to that. um, And then you just do the activity of a word search. And it's very calming and distracting, but at the same time, it's healing. Educational too. Educational, you you know, you realize that what I showed you was gaslighting. (laughs) And, you know, there's a lot of different things that are related to gaslighting. And and then that could prompt someone to kind of do their own research. Kind of that same teacher in me is encouraging others to to do the work so that they can connect the dots to their own experience or put the pieces of the puzzle together for them. Well, I, I think if you don't mind, I, I, can we kind of go a little more in depth on a couple of these terms that you had, uh, we have been discussing so that those of us that are, are listening and those that are um, watching uh, have a better understanding as to whether or not they might fit within that. Uh, we've talked about parental alienation. Can you help us understand what exactly parental alienation is? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to. I mean, it's a very unhappy dynamic that happens to millions of wonderful fathers and mothers, and of course, children, and it affects grandparents and extended family. So it's a family dynamic that usually happens in a divorce or separation situation where one parent um, is out to destroy the other parent, you know, even though this dynamic is really a form of child abuse. It really is more a form and the researchers like Dr. Jennifer Harmon out of Colorado, um, she says that it's intimate partner violence. And so what they do is try to align the children with them as a means to destroy their ex, 
you know, and they, they can sometimes do this unintentionally, but so many of these, um, abusers, alienators do it with malevolence, with a, with a desire to harm the other person. So, uh, how it can play out, for example, is they just at home could say terrible things about the, the other parent. You know, they might, they will outright lie, say that that parent never loved you. I've heard of so many cases where, you know, a parent will say, well, your other parent's dead. They're gone. You know, they killed themselves or, or they died in a car accident. I mean, they will go so far as to do that, to, to cut off any kind of chance that that child could have a relationship with that parent. And, you know, when, um, when it comes to younger children, when there's custody issues, the abusing parent, whether it's a mom or dad, um, and research says that it, you know, happens to both, um, you know, they will interfere with custody. They will make up false allegations and have them arrested. Um, I actually, even though my two children were adults when I chose to divorce, um, at one point, um, my adult daughter had an order of protection granted against me because I wanted to try to connect with her. I wanted to send Christmas cards, birthday cards, just every day, you know, I mean, it was just shocking not to have my child in my life just ripped away when we had two decades of a very positive, loving relationship. But, you know, unfortunately, uh, justice does not always prevail. And, and, you know, um, courts and lawyers and judges can believe lies. And, you know, usually the people that are lying are calm, cool, and collected. You know, they love the, the legal chaos, you know, because they, they feel a lot of empowerment and control. They want to punish the, the loving, good people. And, you know, in my case, I didn't stand a chance. I didn't, even though thousands and thousands of dollars were paid out to try to let the truth be known that I am not a harm or a threat to my child at all, uh, that this is made up and, and most likely, you know, um, supported by the alienator, by the abuser. Um, you know, I wasn't even allowed to say a word. I mean, not, not, not a word. And so then your life is changed dramatically when, you know, you're someone who didn't even have a traffic ticket and now you have an order of protection against you. And, and that was really sad and shocking and uh, actually impacted a lot of my international travel um, because, you know, you're put on some kind of list. Now that has expired, um, but, you know, I've sort of learned my lesson that you know, as much as I would love to reach out to my adult children, I'm not going to risk my freedom, my safety, my, my life. Um, at this point, especially with my podcasts and my interviews and uh, my writing, um, I have done the best that I possibly can to communicate and um, let my children know that I love them more than anything. Um, and I, you know, I'm trying to bring awareness to parental alienation. So to get back to your question about parental alienation, sorry, I kind of, because it, it is, it's such a painful dynamic. But, you know, when you're with uh, minor children, um, it can be completely devastating uh, where, where people are, are moved out of state without your knowledge or, or permission. Court orders aren't followed. And, and usually the targeted parent which is the loving parent that's been abused. Um, they don't want to engage in more legal things. They want to get away from the court systems and get away from their abuser. Um, but, you know, they also don't have the money, the resources, because so many of these abusers are, are so money obsessed. They make sure that you are left with nothing, you know, that you are left homeless, you know, with no money. And, and that was the case for me as well. Now, when they're with adult children, 
they can um, plant such a false narrative and, and people will think, well, you must have done something to make your child estranged from you. But no, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, just like adults can be, um, you know, roped into a cult, you know, with false pretenses and malevolent intentions, that can happen to our children as well. And um, they can be bought off with expensive gifts and, and, and they can be fed a complete false narrative. I mean, the, the abusing parent will throw away your photographs. They will, they'll intercept any kind of cards or gifts, uh, any of the scrapbooks or mementos that you, you know, put together lovingly for all these years for your children, you know, they're gone. They're nowhere to be found. Uh, luckily in my case, I did take digital photographs of a lot of things. If ever down the road, they wanted proof that, you know, their mother loved them to the moon and back, but you know, you would think at some point, you know, their light bulb will go on. And sometimes the intergenerational, aspect of parental alienation plays out for a lifetime and families are destroyed, you know, and, and one big thing with parental alienation, not only do they cut off that loving parent, they cut off that entire side of the family. So they want nothing to do, not even with pets. I mean, they just, they, it's an all black or all white situation. There's no gray in between. And, and that's part of the dynamic. It's a, a devastating dynamic. And there are just, and actually, Michael, some people, and I'm sure with your background that you are very well aware of some situations, but we read about it at least once a week in the news where one angry parent will kill the other parent or even kill the children because they don't want that other parent to have a relationship or to be happy. And there's some devastating cases where, um, you know, lives are lost because of one malevolent person and their ego and their disorder, you know, um, where they, they want to give that image that that other loving parent did something terrible when that's not the case at all. But they're it's very, very they're unfortunate. Yeah, I, it's extremely unfortunate that they um, use children as pawns in regard yeah. to this. And yes, I do have seen that in my background um, yeah. with regard to my career as well as uh, personally um, yeah. in those kind of situations. And it's, it's not very good, but at least it gives us a better understanding of what parental alienation is. So if you are experiencing it, then you know, you've, at least, you've got some tools uh, in, in your books that can help people to understand it. And once you start understanding it, it can help you work through it. And maybe right. Can... And there's some, there's some major researchers. I mean, people that have actually gone so far as to conduct research in the literature, Dr. Amy Baker, Dr. Craig Childress, Dr. Jennifer Harmon out of Colorado has done extensive work bringing awareness to this, but also just showing the numbers and right. explaining specifically what it is. I had no idea that I, I knew things didn't seem right when I didn't hear from my child in a week, right. but then that week turned to a couple of weeks and then a month and then years. And then the years are almost too many to count. It's, it's unbelievable. It happens. It happens so quickly. Yet the abusers hmm. probably started the gaslighting years and years prior so that they could discredit you you know, with false, a false narrative so that when the alienation actually happens, um, you know, people buy into the lies. Which, uh, you know, again, it's, 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 I have to pick my words carefully because I, I really, I mean, I understand it both from a personal perspective from my childhood growing up, uh, did not understand it as parental alienation until recently. But when I look back on my experience, that's exactly what it was. My mother doing the and same thing. Both my parents alienated me from each other. So there was a time that my dad alienated us and had my mom committed right. into psych wards and, you know, just really removed her from our home. But then my mother in retaliation did some of that bad mouthing and 
alienation when we were older. So really, um, sometimes it can go both ways. Most of the time, it's just one predator and one prey, you know, one perpetrator. And I'm sure that contributes to the intergenerational family trauma that we did discuss earlier as well, sure. which if, you know, if um, we can help people understand that and how it plays into that, because uh, again, I know that you have books and these tools available for, for helping people yeah. to get through these, but uh, for somebody to, as you said earlier, to at least understand or be aware that, oh, maybe that's something that fits me. Maybe that's something that I need help with in regard to that. So intergenerational family, I have to keep looking at it to make sure I'm saying yeah, it right. Intergenerational <laughs> family trauma. Yeah. Intergenerational family trauma. Um, I'm sure that that's part of what plays into that, uh, correct? Sure. Yes. Yes, it is. And actually, you know, um, then it, you, you need to really make a distinction, too, between estrangement and alienation, because if someone estranges from a family member, for example, they might have real good reason to estrange from them, you know, um, where the, the people that you are leaving behind because you're putting up some safe boundaries for yourself may not understand it. They might think, oh, you're so self-absorbed or you're going through a phase while you're not talking to us. When really your light bulb could go on and you realize you need to, you need to uh, protect yourself from chaos, anger, confrontation, false narrative, you know, and the feeling, the feeling that, you know, um, some of these family members really say they love you and they, they go through the motions, but you, you know, it doesn't go much deeper than that. And that you really don't feel valued and you don't feel loved and, and, so you might choose to estrange. Um, and then, of course, there's extreme cases where, you know, for safety reasons, you, you estrange. But alienation is different. It's when someone else, you know, has put in this narrative in someone else's head. So at some point in people's lives, when they do all this, this inner work to figure out their childhood and then their you know, adult situation, they may make some choices in their lives that not everyone sits well with because they want to keep the status quo and, and, and they think everything's just fine. And, um, but it's not. And at some point, you know, you have to make some tough decisions about, you know, protecting yourself. And it's not a selfish thing. It's not a selfish thing to put up some healthy boundaries and and not allow you know this trauma to continue i kind of feel like in many ways i'm trying to break this intergenerational curse um you know and and it's it's hard to do but i think it's it's very necessary i think i can relate intergenerational from looking back on my especially my career in domestic violence where the um, and this can happen in both, whether it be male or female. It could be the mother or it could be the father. It could be the boyfriend. It could be the girlfriend. They have a, a domestic violence situation, both physically and or mentally. And um, it's because their parents did it. And um, then when you look back on that, uh, you dig a little deeper and you find out not only did they, his, his or her parents did it, their parents did it. Yes, so it was it carried through. down the line. Yes. And that, you know, the, the traumas and the issues and the way that they raise their children reflect what has been given to them prior to. And that's carried down through the generations, at least the way I understand it. Um, I agree. I agree. Yep. I and, you that, know, back in the the our grandparents and great grandparents generation, um, not only did they have no support, you know, they didn't have platforms. Right like your amazing podcast to talk about this. They didn't have researchers. They didn't have self-help groups or meetup groups to talk about this. They were, they were told to be silent and you just, you just put up with it and, and, you know, yeah. leaving to protect yourself was really not even an option for, for many of our ancestors. Or burying it in alcohol. Yeah, definitely. And that carries on in generations, in generations as well. As well. Yeah. yeah. 
And I think that obviously you you have been able to present tools for people, some opportunity for them to get some education and to be inspired and motivated to kind of move out of those situations and to kind of move their life forward in a very positive way. And um, you've done so by these magnificent yeah. six textbooks, or well, I call them yeah. textbooks, but we'll call them, what do you want to call them? <laughs> well, like, you know, um, well, inspiration and and resources and maybe a creative approach to deal with not only spiritual signs and synchronicities that people might experience, but also some of the traumas of domestic violence and and abuse and intergenerational family trauma. So I look at them as as kind of a support, just one of many, many tools that are out there to help people, you know, realize what they've been through and get some validation and 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 try to reverse some of the gaslighting and get strong within themselves so that they can stand up for themselves and realize that they're not alone and that other people have gone through challenging times and and we all learn by by you know not only our own gut feeling and and how we want to handle things but we also learn by you know, other people's examples of what they have done. So someone might come away and say, well, gosh, if she could write about this and, or if she could, you know, be positive after all these negative things she experienced, then maybe I can too. And how can somebody find your books? You know, they're all on Amazon um, and in the e-version as well. Um, they're at Barnes and Noble. They're at Balboa Press, which is a division of Hay House. That's my my publisher. Um, but actually, I'm finding out, you know, after kind of touring the world, touring the the nation, that my book is surprisingly actually in many, at least the spiritual fiction is in many bookstores, um, which is just very cool, you know, to to because writing in so many ways is such a solitary endeavor, you know, you're not, and it's certainly not a monetary endeavor, you know, I'm not making any money on anything I'm doing related to this, but you know, I'm at a point in my life where, um, you know, I, I don't need that. And I, I, the passion for, um, bringing awareness, you know, outweighs any kind of, you know, other, reason for writing books. So the books, you know, it's real easy to find on Amazon, but my website is godcametomygaragesale.com. And there you can find out not only about me and the books, but you can find out about the various people that endorsed all of the books. And they are resources within themselves. So you can take one of their names and, and look them up and see what they are up to and what they're doing to contribute to um, resources, education, and awareness on, on the various topics. That's fantastic. And I'll make sure that that's all in the show notes for everybody so they have an easy access to be able to accomplish what they want to accomplish, especially if they're experiencing or if they know somebody that's experiencing any of these um, issues that we've discussed here, the violence, domestic violence, the narcissist, the abuse, the parental alienation, the intergenerational family trauma, and more. So, uh, yeah. and what a brilliant book with the, uh, with the God came to my garage sale. I think that's a fantastic title and uh, the collections that you have uh, put into it, I'm sure will also inspire and motivate people as well. This is one more thing before you go, Marnie. So before we go, do you have any words of wisdom you can share? Well, um, you know, I would say to anyone that is going through any kind of challenge or adversity, because it may look different for everyone else, whether it's health, family, job, you know, just uh, having a place to sleep for the night, whatever your challenge is, you can rise above your challenges with the inner knowing that you are a loving, wonderful human being. And, you know, you have the power to change your circumstances. And sometimes it takes, it's a journey. Sometimes it takes some, some research and some work, but you can get there. So please, if you're in any kind of feeling of despair, realize that, you know, there's one more day and, and one more thing that you can do before you go. 
That is more. That's brilliant words of wisdom. Thank you very much for sharing your journey with me. Thank you very much for the words of wisdom, the inspiration, the motivation, and the education that you've given us in regard to um, some very personal experiences yeah. that uh, sometimes need to be addressed. So thank you very much. I'd love to have a conversation down the road with you again. Well, thank you, Michael. It's just been an honor. Very, very special to have this conversation. And I thank you for what you have done in your career, but what you continue to do to just bring awareness to so many topics and, and to have these candid conversations. I think they're so meaningful for people um, that you really go in depth. And I think, you know, hopefully we're making a difference in the world with our voices. Uh, thank you very much. And I believe and have faith that uh, we are. So, Marty, thank you very much. Until the next time, have a great day. Thanks for listening to this episode. One more thing before you go. Check out our website at beforeyougopodcast.com. One more thing before you go. Established 2010. All rights reserved.